Steve Englehart and Frank Bronner uh, in 1974 were in an apartment sitting around dropping acid, eating mushrooms, trying to make their deadline for the reemergence of a Marvel comic book character. C, C, he's a, he was on the C team. He wasn't Captain America or Iron Man or Thor or anything like that. His name was Dr. Strange, Dr. Stephen Strange. And they reimagined Dr. Strange into the Marvel Universe by starting the whole thing over again. And those 74, 75, 76 comics were all entheogenic. And we're coming up just next year with the Marvel's rendition into cinema, Doctor Strange. And what I look at when I look at the entheogenic community is that ayahuasca may be medicine, MD, MDMA or Iboga or Hawaiian baby rosewood, whatever. But mushrooms have always been special to me. I don't see them as medicine. They can be used as medicine because you can use anything for medicine. You can use water. Water is medicine, but you don't call water medicine. You say, well, like, let me get a glass of medicine. <laughs> Psilocybin is a tool in its first and foremost principle as a tool of exploration. And I think what we need in this community is more Dr. Strangers. We need more sorcerers. We need more magicians. You know, this is the land of Hogwarts, you know. Uh, you, sh you should be grabbing them mushrooms in October and, uh, you know, going off to school. To be able to explore, to be able to look into the darkness and say, hey, I'm not looking for the light in the darkness. I'm looking for my eyes to adjust to the darkness so I can go deeper into the darkness. I know and understand that this is not just a feel-good uh, friendly bubbles and fairies type of thing. It's also hard work. It's deep work. It's the places that you don't want to face inside of yourself and in, uh, inside of the multiverse. So we need more Dr. Strangers. We need those folks who are going to go out and encounter the entities that are in these places and spaces because they are there. And they're not all likable and lovable and you know, the, the swirling divas of, of, uh, of Hindu uh, uh, pantheons. There is the Mahabharata there also. Where there's, where there's war, where there's malevolence, where there's horror, where there's fear, and all of those things are there. And we still push forward and move forward because it's something that we have to do to become something more. And I think that's what entheogens do for us. It is something to make us more than what we are as being human beings. I think it ushered us into the human and will eventually usher us into the transhumanistic realms and then ultimately into something uh, that is unimaginable. Ray Kurzweil and them, when they're talking about the technological portion of this, they're talking about the technological singularity. They're talking about merging with AIs, downloading consciousness into com supercomputers. But we already have the supercomputer, we already have the hardware, we already have the software in the entheogens that nature provided us from the beginning. When we were walking on the, the uh, Sahara, you know, came from outer space. But outer space is nothing out there, it's all inside. When we look at Alpha Centauri and Vega and Orion and Sirius, they're not out there, they're inside. So when we look out, we're only looking at a reflection of what's inside of us. So these things came through the multiverse to be able to pair with us, for us to be able to merge with them, and they deliver their information to us. Because the models that we built in the world are only models that we are taking from ourselves. So software, down, uh, downloading, uploading, you know, improving hardware, putting in the new chip, erasing the whole hard drive. All those things are part of what happens inside of us. And it's in our community, it's in the, the, the literature, it's in the lectures. 
We just have to start embracing. And when I was talking about Marvel Comics, because Marvel Comics is driven through entheogens and LSD and mushrooms and things like that. All the same two guys that were hooking up Dr. Strange by sitting in an apartment in New York dropping acid eating mushrooms are the same ones who created Guardians of the Galaxy and the Infinity Stone and the whole new Marvel Universe that's going to be put out in the movies and it's coming out in the movies in Avengers 3 and Doctor Strange and the Black Panther all of those movies are a reflection of the entheogenic usage of those 60s guys who came back from Vietnam and were utilizing entheogens and they moved past the old guard of Marvel which were Steve Ditko and um, Stan Lee and those uh, older guys who had brought it up to a certain level the Black Panther's coming out in 2016 also. It's going to talk about Wakanda and the highest level civilization of Africa that is not a fantasy. They didn't just make these things up. Jack Kirby, who was the, really the brains behind Marvel Comics, not Stan Lee. Stan Lee was the executive. Jack Kirby, who created the Black Panther in 1966 during the Black uprisings in the United States and here in the UK and other places around the world brought the first black superhero to Marvel Comics and he talked about Wakanda which was a mythical place but Wakanda is not a mythical place and is not a mythical people and the Black Panther is not a mythical comic book character you have the Black Panther Society in Africa which eats the Amanita uh, Pantherina mushroom to get the powers of the Black Panther. They use the Black Panther mushroom for the powers of the Black Panther. But they use the same mushroom in Japan and that mushroom delivered what was called ninjutsu or the dark Japanese martial arts. Ninjutsu came out of a mushroom, a psychedelic mushroom. As a matter of fact, for those that don't know, I'm a martial artist. That's what I do as my work. I teach martial arts, ancient and, tradi and traditional and contemporary African fighting sciences. And all of the martial arts that you see have entheogens that go along with them. How you think, you know, the Kung Fu guys, you know, they're standing on a blade of grass or jumping to the top of the tree and, you know, uh, a thousand arrows come and they just knock them out of the way. That's all entheogenic use. Because they would have battles where they never engaged physically. They took the entheogen, stood back, and they battled entheogenically between the two warriors. So nobody was killed, but you find out who had the best skill and the most skill. These type of things went on, they were common. You know, we had masquerade warfare. Where you see the masquerades in Africa, you may see a bunch of raffia or somebody on stilts and things like that. They did battle the same way. This was all part of the sensibility of the entheogenic use in ancient times in the ancient world that is re-emerging now. We're only at the beginning. People always say that the 60s was a failure. Oh, the hippies are gone and the 60s was a failure. They got rid of No, that was just the beginning. It's a baby now, just learning to walk. This conference is just standing up on your feet, waddling and toddling. But when the next generation gets into this, because they're already there anyway, they don't, want to, they don't want your schooling, they don't want your knowledge, they don't want your information, they want to go into the multiverse and bring back a new human being, as Moody was talking about earlier, a new archetype, a new paradigm. <coughs> because being a human being, you can't do nothing. You know, what, you're going to work uh, 10 hours a day for 60 years to sit down and die? That's a great life. <laughs> or are you going to stand when you want to come to this conference that you don't have to get on a plane and fly five hours to Dublin, stay in Dublin for 15 hours sitting in a chair, then come to the Breaking Convention Conference running down the hallway to get here. No, you want to come to Breaking Convention, you just go ding a ding a ding and whoop. You know, we, okay, I'm ready to give my lecture. You know, or we do the conference like this. We all Friday night at 11 o'clock. Take 30 dried grams of psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> we lie down in the dark. And we all meet up in a place in the hyperdimensional realms and have the conference there. And the conference, can, you know, we have great food, great times, you know. 
You don't have to worry about sitting in the chair. You can just be floating in the lotus posture. You know. This is what this is my vision. Beyond the human being, beyond what we are now. So when we first encountered these mushrooms on the Sahara and ate them and said, oh man, this is something different, you know. Now let's make some more sophisticated tools. Let's, you know, uh, let's, get to, let's make a wheel, you know. You know, I've been envisioning this building. Um, it's, you know, it's wide at the base and it goes to a point. What are we going to do with it? I don't know, but let's make it. But most folks don't know that the Merkut, or what do we call the pyramid, is a time machine and a teleportation device. That, you know, they're for teleporting to different spots. Well, that's another lecture. <laughs> Man's uh, relationship with cattle, because these mushrooms are prophylic, they grow on cow dung. Kemet, or Egypt, has a very developed secret pharmacological, entheogenic culture inside of it. That's the secret of Kemet, of Egypt. That's where they got how to build pyramids and Tekken and all those different types of things. They brought back what they saw in their sojourns by utilizing the, the tree of life, which was the sacred acacia, which was DMT, mixed with uh, the Syrian rue, also the sacred mushroom, also the lotus with some other things mixed with the lotus. They downloaded into the macro world what they saw in the world of the heavens. And so when they saw these things built in light out of light in the hyperdimensional realms, they came back and they built their civilization around what they saw in their sojourns and they built out of stone and granite what they saw in light in the hyperdimensional realms. So Wasir or Osiris or the Lord of the perfect black, the one who is the master of the underworld, represents the underworld that the mushroom mycelium grows in, the land of darkness, the underworld, before it springs into the light. So this is a representation of a psilocybin mushroom on my right and Ansar Wasir Osiris on the left. He's in his mushroom form. Because it's the knowledge of the dark world, the underworld, that Osiris brings in all of his majesty and understanding and things like this. Africa, we don't separate spirit from everything else. Everything you do is spiritual. It ain't no, we're going to, okay, we're going to go to class tonight and do the lotus posture or the dead dog or we're going to church and sing a hymn. No, everything you do is spiritual. When you go to get a bucket of water, that's spiritual. When you... the most spiritual thing you can do is farm. They say, do you meditate? Nope, what do you do? I plant uh, beets and potatoes. That's spiritual. There's no better meditation than you standing there hoeing the weeds out. You gotta concentrate so you don't hit your foot. You have to make sure, <laughs> sure there's no weeds are left. Everything is spiritual. So we don't separate the spirit from the matter. The, spirit from our work. Khalil Gibran said, work made visible is spiritual. Paraphrasing. Work made visible is spiritual. So what I'm saying is, is that we're approaching, or we're in the middle of a singularity. The last 100,000 years has been a singularity. We think it's been a long time, but it's been only a blink in the time as far as our relationship and the Earth's relationship to the rest of the universe. So it's only been like that. We've only been human like that. So we're in the middle of a singularity. We're in the, mo in the middle of a movement. And each and every one of you are at the forefront of that movement of us becoming something different. So as I said, at the first breaking convention conference up the road in Canterbury. I said, we need to take more. We need to be responsible in taking that more. In other words, you don't just jump into 30 grams, you incrementally move that way. And there's nothing wrong with coming back down if you have to, and there's nothing wrong with never doing that if that's not what you're here to do. But for those 
people who have the wherewithal and the tenacity to be able to go into the higher doses, I think that is the way to go. So psilocybin as a tool of exploration because we need more Dr. Strangers, as I said earlier. We need those who are going to encounter those beings in the multiverse and sojourn with them for knowledge, for power, for understanding, and bring those things back and say, hey, you know, I saw a djinn named Ulba who was powerful. He tried to trick me out of, uh, tri trick me into killing myself, but I'm, st I'm still here. He's not. But this is what it's about. It's about becoming more. In Africa, although many things are still secret, has been at the forefront of this movement of the progression of the human into the next level since we became human. And I think that this movement is moving forward. I think that a lot, uh, there'll, there'll be a lot of difficult times, you know, because we, you know, the ayahuasca thing is going kind of, you know, it's becoming kind of touristy and things like that, and you know, the, the tourist doses and things like that. But people who are serious, who are dealing with this type of medicine and changing their lives with it, I think it's a very positive thing. But psilocybin is different. It's a whole different animal as far as the journey is concerned. There's no bottom to it. You can't get to the bottom of it. Nobody knows what it is. There are no experts. You know, I've been doing it more than 40 years. And, you know, last year they threw me a loop. You know, I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to take 35 grams and it ain't no big deal. I'm moving up to 40 and things like that. But it threw me for a loop. You know, and I'm no different than anybody else. I'm not the, the badass and all that kind of stuff. I'm just a person who wants to know. And I'll make the sacrifice to know what this thing is about. But never think that you got a handle on it. That's all I'm saying. Each one is different. And you can do it 40 years or 50 years and think you got a handle on it and lay down in that bed in the dark. And the next thing you know, you, you know, you, you down in the basement looking at the wall saying, what happened? <laughs> you know, so I, I don't have any more time, but thank you very much. I appreciate you. <laughs>